Dr. Ahmed, please, uh, you have the microphone. You can start your presentation. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be among uh, you today. Uh, and I'd like to thank Dr. Haysan Badawi for the uh, kind invitation and uh, the warming introduction. Uh, let me first share my slides. Um, I think you can see the slides now. Can you see the slides? Yeah, yes, yeah, Ahmed. Yes, okay. we can. Yes. yes. Uh, today we will be talking about uh, neurogenic uh, voiding dysfunction in children. I think we were lucky uh, in the past few days to see some uh, lectures talking about the same topic. So I hope you will enjoy the lecture today. You will find it diff different and learn something new. I have nothing to disclose. And uh, this is the list of topics that I will try to cover today. Again, it's a very big topic and it's difficult to cover all the points in that short time frame. But I will try to give you a good overview about neurogenic bladder dysfunction. We will talk about the spectrum of the disease. What are our, our goals when approaching with the neurogenic voiding dysfunction? And what are the strategies to treat? How can we choose the best uh, line of treatment and how should we follow up our patients and if we need surgery what are the indications for surgery and what type of surgery should be done and uh, i will briefly cover uh, other medical aspects of spina bifida patient and spina bifida patient i will and uh, i will give a brief note in on prenatal closure and diagnosis of uti in patients with neurogenic bladder if time elapsed uh, as all of you know um, and neurogenic voiding dysfunction is not a single disease, but it is rather a group of diseases. These diseases can um, have different clinical presentation and each and every one of them can have a different pattern of bladder dysfunction. Even in every single patient, the pattern of bladder dysfunction can change over time. Um, the most common uh, cause of neurogenic bladder dysfunction in children is Spina bifida, also known as spinal dystrophy, is the open defect, whether it's megamyosine, which is the most common, or closed defect like thick uh, phylum terminal or libonangocele, and so on. Other pathologies uh, like sacral agenesis, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injuries, transverse malaise, can also uh, present with the neurogenic uh, bladder dysfunction. And uh, also pelvic condition in erectile malformation and cervical anomalies can have associated neurogenic voiding dysfunction, even neuromuscular disorders like muscle dystrophy uh, and uh, muscle atrophy can also present with uh, neurogenic bladder dysfunction. Most of my talk will focus on the spina bifida or the spinal uh, dystrophism group. So when we uh, are approaching uh, certain patients, we have to identify our goals of treatment in order to uh, select the proper treatment plan. And uh, these goals of treatment are, you will find it uh, written in every uh, single book chapter or uh, our, uh, review article on um, uh, neurogenic voiding dysfunction. And uh, of course, our first priority should to preserve the upper tract. Again, preservation of the upper tract should be on the top of our goals when uh, treating a patient with neurogenic voiding dysfunction. Second goal is again preservation of the upper tract and preservation of the upper tract. Uh, one other goal that we should emphasize, it's sometimes overlooked, is prevention of bladder damage. This goal is sometimes overlooked in some of the literature uh, on spina bifida. And also we have to prevent UTI. And when we talk about UTI in patients with neurogenic bladder, as I will, uh, uh, mentioned later, we are talking about symptomatic infection and specifically febrile infections. And uh, later on in life, when these patients approach or uh, uh, the school age, continence or dryness and uh, quality of life or independence become an issue. Again, uh, preservation of the upper tract should always be our priority because sometimes these goals do not go in parallel. Sometimes when you try to achieve continence, you may put the upper tract and risk at risk, and um, some, some leakage or some uh, incontinence is sometimes protective to the upper tract. So we have always to keep in mind that uh, incontinence or wetness is a social inconvenience, 
it's not life threatening, but preservation of the upper tract should always be our priority in all age groups. Um, so what we have, so how can we preserve the upper tract in patients with the neurogenic bladder? So most of patients uh, born with the spina bifida are born with normal upper tracts. Uh, only five to 10% would have upper tract changes at birth. But uh, upper tract damage occurs later in life as a result of bladder dysfunction. In order to prevent upper tract damage, our uh, strategy should, should be directed towards normalizing bladder dynamics, trying to mimic the normal micturition uh, cycle and prevention of UTI and we can prevent UTI again by trying to normalize the bladder dynamics and uh, treating the associated bowel uh, dysfunction. Um, so how can we monitor upper tract changes or damage? Uh, we can monitor serum creatinine, estimated GFR, renal bladder ultrasound, and uh, sometimes or some institution would order DMSA scan to detect any parental changes as a baseline and later on in patients who may suffer recurrent attacks Nephritis. Uh, in reality, uh, the most realistic way to monitor up the upper tract is renal bladder ultrasound because serum creatinine is a, a late sign of renal damage. And because spina bifida patients are different because they have lean uh, muscle mass, the creatinine may not accurately affect uh, renal function because uh, in order for the serum creatinine to change we would expect to see a significant uh, upper tract damage. And some other studies have talked about cystatency as a uh, potential uh, replacement for uh, serum creatinine to estimate the renal function. DMSK, DMSA scan, it, uh, of course, it is expensive. It's not widely available. So the most realistic way to monitor the upper tract is renal blood or ultrasound. Um, the second goal when treating uh, patients with neurogenic voiding dysfunction is prevention of bladder damage, yes. So we have always to keep in mind that the bladder is a living organ, like most of our organs, the heart, kidneys, lungs, and liver. They have certain uh, capacity to perform a certain function. Uh, if this organ is uh, overloaded or works against increased workload, that organ will end up with organ failure. So as all of you know, the normal function of the bladder is to store urine uh, during the storage phase and uh, at low pressure to preserve, to protect the upper tract and empty uh, during the voiding phase with uh, reasonable voiding pressure and minimal post void residual. If this cycle is disturbed and if the bladder dysfunction left untreated for a long time, these, this bladder, uh, bladder will try to overcome the increased workload by the truce or hypertrophy initially but if uh, this dysfunction is not addressed or treated, the bladder histology and ultrastructure will change with increased deposition of collagen and the bladder wall becomes stiff or less compliant uh, at certain point. And at some point, this damage becomes irreversible. So we have to keep this idea in our minds. So we have to try to address the bladder dysfunction as early as possible to prevent bladder or irreversible bladder damage. And also we have to keep in our minds that the spina bifida in particular is a dynamic disease and the bladder dysfunction may change over time. As I mentioned, uh, uh, the main uh, inciting factor for bladder damage uh, or upper tract damage in patients with the spina bifida is the trusor sphincter dysynergia. And uh, in response to that, the trusor were hypertrophied to overcome the increased outlet resistance and this can, can manifest clinically with the trusor overactivity. And we can treat this effectively with anticholinergics most of the time. And in those who are refractory to anticholinergic medication, Botox uh, injection could be helpful. But if this dysfunction is left untreated, the collagen deposition in the bladder wall or the bladder matrix will, will change. And this could result in reduced bladder compliance and at that point, anticholinergics and Botox injection are much less helpful than before. And the only option we will have at this point is bladder augmentation. So again, don't wait for this bladder to change to this point before you initiate treatment. Therefore, treatment of neurogenic voiding dysfunction should be initiated since birth. Um, this, this is an article, article that was wrote by Dr. Christopher Woodhouse. Uh, Woodhouse um, is a famous name in the transitional urology. And it was published uh, 
think, 12 years ago, and I have quoted some words from this nice article. I invite you, all of you, to read. At all ages, renal failure is the commonest cause of death in patients with meningomyosis. Therefore, urologic care is of utmost importance. Sadly, nothing in spinal epithelia gets better with age, so everything is likely to deteriorate with time. The bladder dysfunction, the um, motor uh, ability, the spinal deformity, the patient habitus changes, they become obese, they become uh, weaker, and they, they have this deterioration of the motor. So nothing gets better with age. So we have to be proactive, start treatment as early as possible. It's not likely that the bladder dysfunction will improve over time. And in spina bifida, the natural history of the renal tract as an untreated bladder dysfunction is progressive deterioration by the age of three years and up to 58% of patients. Again, two thirds or almost two thirds of patients will have upper tract damage by an age of three years if left untreated and the bladder never improves with time. And even if we decide to go for surgery, surgical reconstruction becomes progressively more difficult as the patient gets older, as I will discuss later. And by 35 years of age, about 50% will have died. This is according to the Western statistics. I think we have a shorter life expectancy in our countries. So what are the treatment strategies for um, neurogenic voiding dysfunction in patients with spina bifida? There, there are two main approaches that have been used over time, the proactive approach and the expectant or the active approach. And over time, there has been a universal shift or a global shift towards more proactive treatment of neurogenic blood dysfunction. And this shift or paradigm shift have, has resulted in reduction of renal failure rates from 30% in the old literature to about 1 to 2% in the more recent studies. So let's talk briefly what is the proactive and what is the expectant or reactive approach. Um, so as the name implies, proactive means that you initiate treatment early with CIC and anticholinergic if needed. Treatment is started immediately after birth and the other aspect of the proactive treatment is routine, frequent, and repeated testing with urodynamics or video urodynamics. While in the expectant uh, treatment approach, uh, advocates of this approach would wait until they see changes in the upper tract before initiating treatment with CIC, and they would perform uh, urodynamics only when they start to see upper tract changes. Of course, the advantages and disadvantages are clear that proactive approach would prevent or delay upper tract and bladder damage, and uh, they would, it, it, uh, theoretically, it would prevent the deterioration of bladder structure and therefore would be, reduce the rate of bladder augmentation. But it, of course, it needs motivated families, it's labor and resource uh, intensive, and it requires repeated and expensive uh, testing. Advocates of the expectant uh, approach, they believe that or claim that you can reverse upper check changes uh, once you initiate treatment. But of course, the disadvantage if you wait for upper check changes, then the uh, blood or damage would have occurred, and sometimes this damage is irreversible, and therefore the expectant approach is associated with higher rates of blood or augmentation. So, again, this is the sequence of events. The blood or, uh, pressure is initially elevated, the blood tries to overcome the athlete's resistance. And if uh, this high pressure persists, then the bladder starts to decompensate, and subsequently you would see upper tract changes. So the proactive approach would start treatment here early in this cascade, but advocates of the uh, reactive or expectant approach would not intervene until they start to see upper tract changes. So again, start your treatment early since birth, don't wait for the, until you see upper tract changes because at this point, the bladder would have probably been, become an end-stage bladder. So um, there are, actually, there have been no good quality studies comparing uh, both approaches. They have been up to my knowledge. There are no randomized controlled studies comparing both approaches. And this table shows some of the studies that have uh, uh, either applied the expectant or uh, proactive approach, but the studies applying the expectant approach on the left-hand side, those 
uh, advocating the proactive approach on the right hand side and those two studies had a mixture of both the expectant and proactive approaches so if we look here to the studies advocating the expectant approach you would expect to see so 56 percent 44 percent on 55 or up to 88 percent of those treated expectantly required cic whether without pharmacotherapy and with longer follow-up you would expect to see more patients requiring cic so again uh, almost two-thirds of the patients required cic later in their life so why not start um, cic early and if we look at the, these two studies comparing uh, uh, the proactive and the reactive or expectant approach, you would uh, find that uh, uh, the rates of blood augmentation are much higher in the uh, group treated expectantly. In this uh, study by Martin Kiefer, 41% treated expectantly required blood augmentation compared to only 17% treated proactively. And uh, in this study, 27% compared to 11% only. Uh, uh, when the proactive uh, approach was adopted. So even if you can achieve similar upper tract outcomes with either approach, but uh, you would expect to see higher rates of blood augmentation or blood damage when the expectant approach was utilized. So uh, I think the proactive approach is the way to go when uh, treating a patient with the uh, uh, spina bifida. And uh, let's learn about this approach and how can we uh, apply it in the real uh, practice. So the proactive approach has two main pillars. First, the early institution of CIC since day one of birth and early frequent and repeated testing with the urodynamics. So let's look at both these pillars and try to analyze those. So how can we apply this? This is a study or a paper that was published by the National uh, or Center of Disease Control National Spina Bifida Patient Registry. For those who uh, are not aware of that uh, collaboration, it's a collaboration among nine uh, US centers with high volumes uh, of patients with spina bifida. They try to standardize the care of uh, patients with spina bifida in order to uh, optimize the outcome. And they advocated the, the proactive approach to treat patients with spina bifida. And this is their supposed uh, treatment uh, strategy they would uh, require to place a fully catheter first until the spinal defect is closed. And once the spinal defect is closed, CIC will start, would be started right away. And of course, you will get medical history, physical exam, and major serum creatinine, get a renal blood ultrasound. And they would get urodynamics routinely for every single patient in the first three months of life after recovery from spinal tract. And they would get another urodynamics at the end of first year, second year, and third years. This is routine for every patient, but for those considered to have unfavorable urodynamics, they would get um, more uh, urodynamics once, at, once more at the age six months, once at the age four years and five years. Patients, so patients with uh, favorable brother dynamics would get at least uh, four urodynamics in the first five years of life and those with unfavorable blood dynamics would get an additional three, making a total of seven urodynamics in the first uh, uh, five years of life. And they will also get a DMSA scan as a baseline at uh, three months. So again, the two main pillars or component is early initiation of CRC, and I agree with this totally. And uh, I will tell you why. Um, so five, as I mentioned, five to two percent of patients are born with upper tract changes, and those would require CIC initiation, irrespective of the approach used, whether approach. And if the left treated safety of twenty percent would have upper tract changes by age of three years, and again, those would require CIC later in life. And the most prevalent urodynamic um, abnormality in patients with spinal bifida is this synergic sphincter and puts the upper tract at risk. And again, so CIC is necessary for the group. And even for those with this uh, synergic with synergic sphincter or denervated sphincter, a uh, significant portion of them marked in orange here will have uh, upper tract damage later on life and therefore they would require uh, CIC. 
eventually 80% at least of patients with spina bifida will require CIC. So why not to start it early in life? Especially given the fact that it's easier for patients to learn and master, and it's easier for children to accept when initiated early in life. And as uh, I have previously outlined, early initiation of CIC would prevent irreversible bladder damage. And even uh, if uh, the patient requires later in life, CIC becomes mandatory or indispensable, uh, irrespective of that, whether you do bladder augmentation or bladder need to increase the output resistance, again, CIC becomes a must. And several studies have reported that early CIC initiation is associated with less risk of less risk of upper tract damage, less risk of VUR, renal scarring, end stage renal disease, and lower need for surgery. So I think CIC should be started right away once the spinal defect is closed and uh, the patient can be placed safely on their back. And um, you should partner with the uh, new neurologist with the NICU team and have them train how to do CIC and the nurses should really master uh, how to do CIC and they should be able to coach and train in how to do CIC. Um, so a quick question just to keep you uh, uh, focused. So this is a scenario for a one day old girl with a spina bifida, open spina bifida. She had back closure and then later she required placement of her VB shunt. And uh, after the catheter was removed, she waited with a moderate residual and the credit maneuver was started. Uh, eight hours later, she developed abdominal distension and has minimal urine output and the bladder was catheterized with very minimal output. Three CC, the next step is bolus, blame to of the abdomen, cystogram, CT scan or lepro. I wish to incorporate this, uh, these questions at the Presentation, but unfortunately, we could not incorporate this uh, uh, presentation. So, this is just to remind you that the credit maneuver should be avoided. It, it's better uh, the, not to use that maneuver in any age group, particularly in the newborn, because there have been reports of uh, bladder rupture following use, uh, following. Uh, utilization of credit maneuver against the increased outlet resistance. So you're just attempting to increase the bladder uh, pressure against the increased outlet resistance and this pressure is at least transmitted to the upper tract and as I mentioned uh, it could even lead to bladder rupture especially in newborns. So the best answer for this question is uh, cystogram to diagnose bladder rupture. So the lesson here is try to avoid credit maneuver. Um, the second the pillar or the constituent or component of the approach, as I mentioned, is repeat uh, um, testing with the urodynamics and frequent testing with urodynamics, even for those who uh, currently seem to be clinically doing well. And the uh, uh, proof of concept is that if you detect dysfunction early, you can address and treat before upper tract um, uh, change would happen. And uh, all of you know are familiar with the, uh, the parameters that will act in neurodynamics. And usually in patients with the neurogenic bladder or the spina bifida, we would focus mainly on the filling phase. So since most of them would be uh, using CIC to, and they, they are not spontaneously avoiding, of course you would comment in the capacity compliance contraction. If you have the truths are over activity, try to confirm uh, when the contractions started and how I or how strong the contractions were. Most of them have diminished bladder sensation. And um, we, our goal when treating patients with the uh, neurogenic bladder is try to keep the uh, filling pressure. And those with uh, the crucial leak point pressure higher than 30 and uh, higher than 30 in some of the previous literature are a higher risk of bladder damage. Um, uh, and um, also, it's better or, or it's good if you can use the pressure specific volumes and I tell you how to use that for those who might be familiar with it. So this is an imaginary uh, detrusor pressure or two curves. So if you look at the most uh, parameter that we would focus on during the filling phase of uh, the urodynamics is the detrusor pressure. 
and we have to be careful or mindful or we try as much as possible to uh, keep the detrusor or the end the detrusor and filling the detrusor pressure less than 40 or better less than 30 centimeter water. So uh, this uh, diagram shows you the concept of pressure specific bladder volume. So those are two curves for our imaginary curve for the detrusor pressure. If you look at both these curves, the end filling pressure is almost the same in both curves. So it's around 30 at maximum systometric capacity. But those curves are quite different as you can observe. This is considered the blue curve is more or less closer to normal. The blood pressure has remained low throughout the filling phase and it only raised uh, way closer to blood capacity. And the, as you can see here, the, the cruiser pressure of 20 centimeter water was reached almost maybe at 75 or 80 percent of the blood capacity. While if you look at this curve, um, the, the cruiser pressure of 20 was reached at almost 50% of the bladder capacity. So when reporting the pressure, we would report on both curves that the end filling pressure for both curves is a 30 centimeter <clears throat> water. And, but when um, you look at the detrusor pressure 20, you should report that uh, the detrusor pressure of 20 was reached at about 80% of maximum capacity compared to 50% or you can report in relation to the bladder volume. Okay. This is really important because this is considered a safe curve or safer curve compared to the other red curve because throughout the second half of the filling phase, you would see that the um, blood pressure is consistently above 20 centimeters of water. <clears throat> Although urodynamics is the best test that we have so far to assist the blood function, it's not without limitation. First, it's an invasive test, it's an expensive test, it's not widely available. Despite several documents or papers that have tried to standardize the way uh, urodynamic tests are done and interpreted by the International Continent Society and so on, it remains to be done in non-standardized fashion and interpretation is sometimes uh, System. So the interpretation of urodynamic results, it varies uh, among institutions and even among uh, different physicians in the same institution. And even if you give the same physician the same urodynamic reason, you may get different impression. And even the conclusions we get from urodynamics are questionable. So this is an interesting study that was published about years ago in the Journal of Urology. Again, this came from the same group, the CDC National Spina Bifida Registry. They sent 20 clinical scenarios of patients with the spina bifida along with the urodynamic tracing and the pictures from the video urodynamics to 14 experts from seven of the participating centers. And those scenarios were sent along with questions on how those experts would interpret the urodynamics. They were asked about uh, questions like, um, do you consider this patient to have the trusor overactivity? Um, do you think that blood pressure is safe? Um, do you think the infilling pressure is less than uh, 40 uh, centimeter water? Do you expect this patient to have uh, poor blood compliance? And if they would change the management based on the findings they have from the clinical scenario as well as the urodynamic risk. Remember, those are our experts in the field. They are not trainees, but you will surprise that there was a um, significant discrepancy or disagreement between their interpretation of the urodynamic results. So they use the CAPA statistics to measure the level of agreement, and it's usually report, like, it's reported in the range from zero to one, with one meaning perfect agreement and zero meaning no agreement at all. And the most parameter that they agreed upon, surprisingly, was blood shape on fluoroscopy. So this is the, the, the information we get usually from BCUGs. Other urodynamic parameters, uh, like end fill, the truth of pressure, blood safety, safe blood safety, compliance, blood mix status, the truth of overactivity, they have at best mo at moderate degree of agreement, if not poor, if you look at the 
uh, the synergy, sphincter, the synergy or the trousal activity. So again, this is very interesting. It means that you could seven, get a significant degree of disagreement when interpreting um, the results of aerodynamics, even among experts. And of course, the inconsistent interpretation would lead to uh, different lines of management. Given the limitations that we talked about, about uh, aerodynamics, some investigators have tried to find more convenient or um, better ways to um, monitor or measure the blood pressure that could support uh, aerodynamic testing. And this from Dr. Corey's group in California. Uh, they were instructing uh, families to uh, measure the blood pressure using this simple way for the week that precedes the clinic visit or urodynamic testing. As a patient uh, were using a CRC as usual, parents were instructed to measure the height of urine column in the catheter that were using uh, for CIC, and they, they used the height of urine column at blood capacity as an expression for um, the blood pressure, and they found that um, maximal CIC uh, pressures less than 20 at blood capacity were associated with normal blood dynamics. And the idea that um, if we use uh, the traditional urodynamics, it gives you just a snapshot uh, of the blood pressure at one point and it's done or repeated maybe once a year or maybe even less frequent. And uh, on the other side, this or similar techniques can uh, give you like real time monitoring of the blood pressure throughout the year and it also gives the families feedback on how the blood pressure is progressing and if treatment is effective and so on. Uh, Chris uh, Cooper and his group from Iowa, they uh, used a similar idea, but they um, uh, created a, a small device that is shown here. This device is connected to the uh, catheter at the time of CIC and it measure the blood pressure and uh, the time of catheterization and the uh, volume of urine uh, retrieved and it records this this information on uh, a smartphone app and uh, it can be saved and even shared with the physician or the hospital uh, data. Um, again, some of you can may can uh, say this is very fantastic. This is unrealistic. It can, you cannot apply this in real time. I think this is convenient for some families who are uh, motivated and well educated. I mean. Um, Patients with uh, uh, diabetes use home devices to monitor their blood sugar, and uh, those with blood uh, hypertension uh, use uh, home devices to monitor their blood pressure. And I think this is much. Uh, this is not much different. And even nowadays, a lot of us are using smartphones to measure how steps they, they we have made, or how miles have we walked, or how calories we have burned. I think this is even uh, more uh, crucial. So uh, the treatment tools we have for patients with the ne neurogenic bladder are listed here in this busy slide. Um, again, our goal is to treat the bladder, prevent upper tract damage, and the tools we have for treatment of the bladder is CIC, medications which are mainly anticholinergics, Botox injection, and for those uh, with weak outlets, they may, may need surgery to increase the outlet resistance or those with upper tract damage, we may need to augment the bladder or uh, do urinary diversion. And the uh, upper tract uh, protection is mainly centered about normalizing bladder uh, dynamics and prevention of urinary tract infection. Of course, bowel um, management is crucial as is, and as is an integral part of treatment of neurogenic bladder. And as those patients grow older, sexual function and fertility uh, becomes an issue, those uh, patients may uh, benefit from medical treatment of uh, erectile dysfunction with a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, intracavernosal injection, or even penile prosthesis. Um, so what, how can we choose the best uh, treatment option for our patients? Um, in fact, the pattern of bladder dysfunction is what determines the proper uh, management option. And um, how can we know the pattern of bladder dysfunction? Of course, urodynamics is the gold standard, but we have to keep in mind its limitations. So we can also get an idea about the pattern of bladder dysfunction using clinical parameter 
in addition to finding on imaging studies like ultrasound and VCUGs. Using the clinical data that you can get and imaging studies, in addition to urodynamics, your patient would fall into one of these four categories. Um, depending on the pattern of sphincter dysfunction and the trouser dysfunction. So you can have an overactive or, under, or underactive sphincter and uh, likewise, you can have an overactive or underactive detrusor function, and uh, by two by two table, you would get one of these four uh, urodynamic patterns. Either you can have a, an overactive sphincter with underactive detrusor, then you would require CIC for this pattern of dysfunction. Um, the second pattern is the most predominant pattern with overactive sphincter and overactive detrusor. And this is uh, considered unsafe or unfavorable. This group is particularly at risk of upper tract damage or repeated infection. Those would require treatment initially with CIC and oxybutynin to address the overactive detrusor. The third, third pattern uh, is uh, if you have underactive sphincter and underactive detrusor, um, classically, those patients would get very small volumes with the CIC. They are wet all the time and their bladder looks smooth on VCUGs, as you can see here in this diagram, and their upper tract is typically normal with the, the, no hydronephrosis. And of course, if you do urodynamics, you would see funneled bladder neck and very low detrusor leak point pressure. Those patients are usually safe, but they need monitoring because the pattern of bladder dysfunction may change over time, and those patients may require outlet surgery to achieve dryness or uh, to treat incontinence. The final, the, the fourth and the last pattern, if you have an overactive detrusor with underactive uh, sphincter, those patients would have trabeculated or ingated bladder like this, but at the same time, they would have funneled the bladder neck, and the, this group of patients can be treated with a CIC and anticholinergics, but they may require outlet surgery as well to treat the outlet deficiency. Again, I'm not against urodynamics. Urodynamics are very helpful, but it only completes or confirms your clinical suspicions. It, it completes the missing piece of the puzzle. It should not go or contradict your, the findings you get from uh, your clinical data and imaging studies. Uh, overall, treatment should be individualized. You have to manage patient uh, uh, with uh, spina bifida on case by case basis. You have to try to treat CIC at birth for everyone. And those with a weak outlet even may uh, improve uh, with a CIC and you may later discontinue CIC for this group in particular if you found that the upper tract is safe with no deterioration and if you are getting uh, very low volumes uh, with the CIC. Again, CIC is crucial. Um, Anticholinergics are used for select group of patients with overactive detrusor. And you should always keep in mind that uh, they have very high incidence of uh, side effects, particularly dry mouth, constipation, and the facial. Uh, flushing compliance is always a big issue in patients maintained on anticholinergics. And if you start CIC, uh, if you start anticholinergic, you would know that we would probably keep your patient on these medications uh, for life because, as I mentioned, that it's unlikely for the bladder dysfunction to improve. And there have been some studies reporting potential long-term effect in cognitive function with long-term use of anticholinergics. This is a scenario here for a four-year-old girl with a spina bifida um, maintained on CIC, but it, she is wet in between catheterization and on your dynamic testing, the detrusor leak point pressure was 50 centimeter water, Valzalva leak point pressure was 70 centimeter, uh, and she was in view of unfavorable bladder dynamics. She was started on oxybutynin. Uh, what would you expect on repeat urodynamic uh, study? Um, what changes you would see on the detrusor leak and Valsalva leak point pressures? I wish we can do this in full, but uh, unfortunately we could not do this for time's sake. So the correct answer is one. Uh, in fact, anticholinergics do not affect the detrusor or Valsalva leak point pressure. 
Uh, yeah. This is a reflection of the outlet uh, function and anticholinergic do, do not affect the bladder outlet, although they may increase the bladder capacity, improve components, and treat associated detrusion over activity. Um, again, uh, keep in mind that this is a very heterogeneous group and um, uh, not only the bladder dysfunction can vary, but those patients have varying degrees of disability. So you may treat two patients with similar bladder dysfunction with two different lines of treatment. Those patients may have different expectations. They have different family support. Uh, they have different levels of dexterity or motor function. So all these factors should be taken into account or put into the equation when considering treatment for patients with spina bifida. And even for a single patient, their uh, uh, disease nature is dynamic. The motor function may change over time and the pattern of bladder dysfunction can change. And in their lifetime, there are two uh, phases of their life at which the, uh, they are more likely to have change of their bladder uh, dysfunction. This is particularly in the first two years of life when they are growing at a fast pace and again at around the time of puberty because in these uh, phases of their life the spine grows rapidly and because of that the spinal cord may become trapped in the scar tissue caused by the first surgery and this may lead to cord tethering and deterioration of the bladder and motor function so therefore follow-up sh should be closed around those two periods of their lifetime and uh, after surgery they the, those patients may require even more close follow-up whether this surgery is a neurosurgery or neurosurgical procedure or blood outlet surgery because these surgeries may uh, cause deterioration of the bladder dynamics and subsequent upper tract damage how to monitor the progress for our patients? So in every clinic visit, you have to ask uh, the patients uh, if they are doing CRC adequately, um, uh, how frequent uh, they do CIC and what catheter size they use, and they, uh, if they are dry in between CIC, uh, and uh, if they have experienced um, a urinary tract infection. Sometimes we get serum creatinine and estimate uh, the GFR. Um, the renal bladder ultrasound is our best friend. Uh, try to get as much information as you can on uh, uh, ultrasound. Sometimes you get uh, VCGs and neurodynamics, but I think you order those if you start to see changes from clinical standpoint with more incontinence or waiting in between catheterization or you start to see some changes in the upper tract. Again, not again in stereodynamics. I, I'm just uh, trying to rationalize its use, especially in, when you have uh, limited uh, resources. So in reality, the main tools that we use to monitor the progress are the clinical data, as well as the renal blood ultrasound with selective use of other imaging studies and urodynamics. This is the proposed follow-up plan by the International Children Continent Society. So the take home here is the, uh, you perform more frequent follow-up uh, in this age group from zero to two years of age. And again, around adolescence, the best tools are ultrasound, uh, ultrasound, ultrasound, and then you order urodynamics when indicated, when indicated, when indicated. So, and when patients grow up, if, if they are stable with no changes, you can space follow-up intervals. And in these age groups, uh, I think you can make use of the uh, techniques that I mentioned earlier to monitor the blood uh, pressure, like home uh, manometry or so, or so on. Of course, the credit should go to Jack Lapidus who introduced the idea of or popularized the use of clean intermittent catheterization in the 70s. Um, so treatment for uh, Spina bifida, we have to uh, highlight that treatment is mainly medical. In very select situation, we would resort to surgery and we would only consider surgery if there is upper tract damage in the form of progressive hydronephrosis, scarring if you, are, if you order DMSA scans or the patients are experiencing or suffering repeated febrile 
urinary tract infection, and I'm saying this again, repeated febrile symptomatic urinary tract infection, or you would consider surgery if you fail to achieve continence despite maximal medical management. So you would exhaust all tools of medical management before you consider surgery for uh, the urinary tract in a patient with spina bifida. And remember that surgery does not eliminate the CIC, but uh, surgery CIC becomes even more crucial or more necessary after surgery uh, because the type of surgeries we do is bladder augmentation. And after bladder augmentation, CIC becomes indispensable in the majority of those patients, even if they were voiding spontaneously before. Or the other type of surgery that is commonly done is uh, bladder outlet surgery. And after that surgery, uh, you would have to make sure that the patient is emptying their bladder efficiently. And even the bladder dynamics itself could change after bladder outlet surgery to become unfavorable and therefore CIC becomes more crucial. Uh, and it's been published or reported that about one-fifth of patients would require bladder uh, reconstruction. Again, surgery focuses on improving the bladder storage dynamic, mainly bladder botox injection initially and a bladder augmentation later on, uh, or increasing the outlet resistance with the various procedures used to, to increase the outlet res resistance to achieve dryness or creation of catheterizable channels for those who are not able to perform CIC per urethra due to anatomic or social uh, situations. Or you may resort to incontinent diversion if the family or the patient cannot perform CIC reliably due to anatomic problems or social concerns. Again, this is another report from the National Spina Bifida Registry reporting the differences in the surgery rate among the participating centers. And on average, 20% of the patients required surgery. And the most commonly performed surgery was bladder augmentation. But they found an interesting finding that the rate of bladder reconstruction varied significantly among the participating centers. Though, although these um, centers adopted the same treatment philosophy, they found that a significant variation in the surgery rate uh, ranging from 12 to 38 percent. So again, the hand, here you can find the operation rate is one in 10. It is, it's almost four out of 10 patients would require surgery. And uh, the uh, information we can get here that the majority of patients can be treated uh, sort of adequately with medical treatment. And again, uh, variation in the interpretation of clinical data and neurodynamic findings can affect um, the decision to proceed with surgery. Even the uh, surgeons or the physician experience and the training may change the threshold to proceed with surgery. And this difference remained consistent even after uh, controlling for other factors. And they also found that some other uh, non-clinical factors may contribute in the decision making for surgery like gender with increased age, you would expect to see uh, uh, higher rates of surgery because the patients becomes more interested in achieving dryness or because the bladder dynamics deteriorate over time. And they found that patients who have reduced the ambulatory ability are more, were more likely to require surgery. Um, um, this is a scenario for a seven-year-old uh, MMC patient that has failed anticholinergic uh, therapy and CIC for a non-compliant neurogenic bladder. He, uh, the plan that uh, to undergo for bladder augmentation. Preoperatively, he had the mechanical bowel prep and received perioperative antibiotics. Uh, and 45 minutes after starting surgery, he had an acute severe hypotension the most likely cause here is dehydration. Latex, latex allergy. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. This is what I'd like to highlight. Latex allergy is a rare but serious complication uh, in patients with the spina bifida. They are known to be allergic or have a higher percentage of patients with the spina bifida are allergic to latex, and this may be uh, may result on anaphylactic shock, which is life threatening. You have to keep that in mind. Even with some simple uh, maneuvers like uh, urodynamics, they may 
uh, develop severe anaphylactic shock. So you have to be aware of that complication. And the recommendation is to try to keep the environment latex free if possible. Yes. Um, so remember these points when you uh, advocate surgery for patients with spina bifida, surgery becomes more difficult and more morbid as patients get older. They become obese, they have limited mobility, um, they are more likely, likely to develop DVTs, wound complication, bit swords, pulmonary complications. So you have to keep all that in mind. Patients with uh, uh, spina bifida, they have strange or weird anatomy sometimes because of their body habitus. They have short torso, so all the viscera sometimes like squashed in a small space. Sometimes you find higher incidence of retrocecal appendix. Sometimes you find the cecum underneath the liver. Uh, a lot of them, they have abdominal adhesions, either because of repeated surgeries or um, uh, the VB shunt itself may inflict a lot of adhesions, especially with the repeated replacement of the VB shunt. The, uh, when they get older, they have short and fatty mesentery, and sometimes uh, you are not able to bring the uh, bowel easily to the pelvis, uh, especially with a small contracted bladder. Um, you have to look careful uh, against VB shunt infection. Um, most of them are constipated and they have large, uh, 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 the colon is always packed with a lot of stool. So um, I think mechanical bowel prep is important and uh, keep in mind latex allergy could happen and it is fatal. Um, uh, this is another scenario for a nine year old girl with a spina bifida. She has urinary incontinence. Neurodynamics has shown normal capacity with good compliance and low valsalva uh, leak point pressure. Again, favorable bladder dynamics with good compliance and low leak point pressure. And she had a facial sling to improve continence or dryness, and this surgery was successful from this standpoint. But four months after surgery, she has recurrent incontinence. Ultrasound was normal. Repeat, urodynamics demonstrated a bladder capacity of 250, a bit reduced for a patient in this age, but uh, a pressure-specific bladder capacity of 150 ml. The bladder pressure was 30 centimeter water at this point. Remember that the bladder had very good compliance at baseline, and the trusor leak point pressure was 60 centimeter water, and on fluoroscopy images, he had bilateral grade one reflux. The next step is prophylactic antibiotic, oral antimuscarinic endoscopic injection of the bladder mix to improve continence or bladder augmentation or bilateral deflux injection. Bladder augmentation, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, so the take home <laughs> message here that uh, the bladder dynamics may deteriorate as a result of uh, increased outlet resistance, but I would start first with oral antimuscarinics with the close follow-up to see if it improves. And if that fails, I think a bladder augmentation could be a reasonable option or Botox if you like to do Botox. So uh, the I, I wouldn't, uh, Ahmed, uh, bit, uh, I wouldn't start uh, doing the sling or outlet uh, procedure without in a neurogenic bladder patient without doing concomitant augmentation. Let us discuss this after you. Yes, talk. this is a debatable issue. Yes, overall, again, those patients who have outlet surgery, they require very close pull-up because if even if they had the favorable bladder dynamics at baseline, they could uh, the bladder dynamics may deteriorate or after surgery. So either you do augmentation at the same session, or you place those patients on close follow-up for fear of upper tract deterioration. Um, and uh, keep in mind that after doing bladder augmentation, patients need lifelong follow-up, and they are likely to require another surgery, if not more. And this is uh, from Indiana group, and they reported in over uh, 400 patients who had bladder augmentation. And uh, within 10 years of follow-up, 44% required another surgery. And even uh, about one-fifth of patients required two or more operations. And they were basically for bladder stones. So a lifelong follow-up is indispensable after bladder augmentation. 
uh, <clears throat> a quick word about prenatal closure. I'm almost done with my presentation. So uh, uh, the idea beyond the prenatal closure is that patients with spina bifida, they have developmental damage or developmental arrest of the neural tissue and the spinal cord. This contributes to the neurologic insult in this group and also exposure to amniotic fluid uh, during uh, intrauterine life can also add to this damage of the neural tissue. So based on this, uh, the idea of uh, prenatal closure was introduced to minimize uh, damage of the neural tissue as a result of exposure to uh, the amniotic fluid. So simply prenatal closure has uh, led to reduction uh, or the results were promising from the neurosurgical standpoint uh, with reduction of the rates of hind brain herniation and the need to place VB shunt and improve the uh, lower extremity function on those who had prenatal closure but the results were not as promising uh, from urology standpoint and uh, the urodynamic testing of the groups that had prenatal uh, closure were not much different from those who had postnatal closure and the rates of using the CIC were also uh, similar. And these are the results from the MOMS trial or the management meningomyocell study. This is the largest uh, randomized controlled trial we have so far on a prenatal closure of MMC, and uh, they reported the, the urologic outcome in two studies in 2015. One last message is that the diagnosis of UTI is uh, in patients with a spina bifida or those who are maintained is on CIC is difficult, and uh, it's important because it can change the uh, treatment plan. And uh, it has been debated in the literature, but I think this, is, this definition is quite reasonable. In order to diagnose UTI in patients on CIC, you require a combination of two symptoms at least, with fever being the most reliable, or and, and positive urine culture of a single organism and significant pyuria in urine microscopy. You have to have the combination of the three and not only one of them because those patients have a significant prevalence of pyuria or bacteria. Again, remember the urology is only one aspect of the problem. It's multi-system disease. Those patients require follow-up with the pediatrician or nephrologist for hypertension, CKD, and they will require good uh, management of their bowels. They require to see an orthopedic or a neurosurgeon. Sometimes they need a psychologist or social worker. So it has to be uh, uh, patients have to be treated within the context of a multidisciplinary clinic and of course uh, parents or care caregivers are the team player in this uh, management because you have to keep them motivated you have to counsel them all the time and to have to make uh, to have them participate in the decision making and they are human beings they, these kids need to play they need to learn they need to go to school and go to college. And when they get older, they need to marry or get married. And remember, you have to, go to have good transition when they, those patients go into adulthood. And the take home message, our preservation of the upper tract should be our primary goal. Care should be started since birth. Uh, renal failure is the leading cause of this. Management has to be proactive with CIC initiated early in life. This group is very heterogeneous and the care has to be individualized. They need close follow-up because the disease has dynamic nature and you have to incorporate other uh, practitioners like the bowel management, uh, orthopedic and neurosurgery. And don't forget back examination. It has to be an integral part of examining uh, every child, particularly if they present with voiding dysfunction, uh, UTI or upper tract changes so that you would not miss like sacral agenesis or closed spine lift. Thank you so much. I appreciate your patience and I apologize for any convenience that could have ha happened. Thank you. Shukran, Shukran Ahmed. A very elaborate and uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any excellent presentation, it excites uh, many, many, many questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed Shuman, Dr. Mohammed Al-Ghanimi, Dr. Mohammed Yusuf, Dr. Ehab Rafat. اللي هم اوريدي بعتوا اسئله ومين تاني دكتور عمر بليز ويت ويز اس هندخل حضراتكم مع الدكتور احمد عبد الحليم uh, كل واحد جمعوا الاسئله بتاعت 
تعليقكم زي ما انتم عايزين اكتبوها قدامكم رتبوا افكاركم لغايه ما تعملوا الكلام ده اسمح لي احمد ممكن ااكد معاك صم مسجز كده في اللي انت قلته بعد اذنك لغايه ما هم يبقوا مستعدين اتفضل اولا احمد انا فهمت ان انت من السكول اوف ذا برو اكتيف مانجمنت فور انيوجينيك بلادر ان تشيلدرن ام اي رايت تمام واحنا في اسكندريه وي ار اوبينج ذا سيم سكول ذا برو اكتيف سكول فور ذا مانجمنت فعايز اسالك يا احمد بوضوح ان براكتس علشان زمايلنا اللي موجودين معانا الصغيرين دلوقتي انت يو هاف بين كولد ان انيكيو اور نيوناتال انتنسيف كير يونت فور ا تشايلد بورن وذ مايلر مينجيسي اند اوبريتد ات بيرث اور تو دايز افتر بيرث فور كلوجر اوف ذا مايلر مينجيسي باي ا نيورو سيرجري اند ذن نيورو سيرجري فينيش تو ذا ورك اند يو ار كولد تو تو اكزامين اند تو كونسلت the parents for this child. What are your steps in practice that you are going to do and the time frame, please? Okay. Um, um, thank you. This is a very important question, Dr. Haysam. Of course, um, you would uh, examine the patient. You would uh, get serum creatinine, but after the first week of life, you would get, of course, a baseline ultrasound. and. Uh, you, I would get a VCG as early as possible or after the spinal closure uh, once you can place the patient on their back. Um, I would start the practice of CIC uh, once it is possible. Usually patients are kept with an indwelling catheter until the back surgery is done. And once the back surgery is done, you can start CIC training. You can, you should teach the family and uh, have the NICU team involved and you have to make sure that they can master or they uh, can master the CIC adequately before they leave the hospital. Um, a circumcision, I would advise circumcision for all boys. Um, I wouldn't start to anticholinergics that early, uh, but uh, maybe later on follow-up if CIC proved to be uh, inadequate. Um, Uh, I, I would bring the patients back in six weeks at least to make sure that they are catheterizing without problems. They don't have any problems with catheterization. Sometimes I would start them on prophylactic antibiotics for a short time because uh, uh, you may get uh, higher rates of infection in the first few days uh, after initiating CIC, but uh, usually it's not prescribed for long term because It does not lower the rates of symptomatic infections, but it may increase infections with more resistant organisms. So usually we follow them up every three months in the first year of life and maybe every six months in the sub subsequent or second or third year. Yes, Ahmed, um, I, I would like you to continue uh, because you have mentioned that the protocol very clearly for the proactive school for management of neurogenic bladder concerning the timing of your dynamics. And I yeah. understood from your talk that uh, the proactive uh, school uh, adopts a neurodynamic study at age of three months. Then if it is hostile, you repeat it at six months and then at one year. And if it is not hostile parameters, you will repeat it um, every year until the age of three years. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. So the proactive approach or advocates of the proactive approach was, would get routine uh, neurodynamics within the first three months, then at one year, then at two, uh, at the end of second and third years. And if the blood or dynamics are poor, it will get another one at six months. And again, in the, at the, by the end of fourth and fifth year. In reality, yeah. uh, we, have, we, have, we have not been doing this on Mansoura. And even when I went uh, to train in a fellowship, this was the same scenario. I tell you what, uh, uh, getting your dynamics in this very young age, Uh, uh, first, it's sometimes difficult to perform. The results are very difficult to interpret. And uh, third, uh, it does not change your management that much. So the, 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 the bladder uh, of a newborn baby is maybe 20, 25 mLs. And the neurodynamics machine that we have, the lowest flow rate that you can get is 5 mL per, per minute. Uh, the baby is moving, crying all the time. So you get a lot of artifact on the uh, urodynamic tracing. 
Sometimes you get some leak around the catheter, and even if it leaks one or two ml, this would still be a significant proportion of the bladder capacity. So I don't know, it's, it's very difficult to interpret. Uh, the results are quite variable. And uh, again, I don't think it, it changes the management that much if you are initiating CIC anyways uh, early in life. I think the only useful information that you can get if there is the truth or overactivity or not, and in that situation, you would start um, anticholinergic medication. But uh, I would rely more on, on the clinical progress and if you see some changes on the ultrasound. I don't know what's Ahmed, the practice. Uh... Ahmed, also you can get an information of the Tetuza leak point pressure, which is very important for the upper tract. Uh, of, am I right? Of course, yes. But I, again, as I mentioned, they leak if they are moving, if they are crying. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to detect minor leaks uh, in these yeah. small babies. And again, uh, the management would be the same, unless... Uh, the only thing you could do at this point, maybe catheterize more frequently or leave an overnight catheter. So I don't know, can, can you tell me, Dr. Hayes, what's your practice on, on, uh, in Alexandria or what have you found? Uh, in the... we, we do at least the baseline neurodynamic uh, study, ultrasound, voiding cystereosogram, and we put children on CIC every four hours. Um, and we monitor them regularly with ultrasound, serum creatinine, uh, measurement of blood pressure, uh, and we don't ask for urine analysis or culture, if, except if the child is symptomatic. Yes. And uh, we repeat the urodynamics ev at least every year if the child is not um, showing any hostile pattern. Because in the, um, uh, the, the points taken on the reactive school is that if you wait until changes in the upper tract are evident in the ultrasound to do the urodynamic studies and to diagnose the hostile bladder, it might be too late to recover the child again, even after a successful treatment. These are the points taken against the reactive school and addressed by actually the proactive uh, school you mentioned. So this is our school in, in Alexandria. Uh, I agree with you, but uh, sometimes, or at least in my experience, it's difficult to interpret uh, or get consistent uh, uh, results out of urodynamic reports. I'm not against urodynamics, don't get me wrong, but uh, sometimes the results could be quite variable and the interpretation can differ from one person you, to the other. You are, you are correct, Ahmed. Can, can I ask you, if um, sedations like um, interrectal uh, uh, dormicum, for example, in France, we were using uh, such uh, tricks to give the child intranasal or intrarectal uh, dormicum, or sometimes um, not in France, the, um, uh, it's called what? The inhalational uh, something, chloral hydride, that mm. makes uh, the child, of course, this to be given, uh, you have to have uh, an anesthetist or a pediatrician at least attending uh, the procedure, which makes it more uh, complicated to, uh, to organize because I, I don't dare to use it uh, alone. Uh, but uh, what do you think about using some uh, sedatives to relax the child? Yes, it could be reasonable. But again, as you mentioned, Dr. Heisem, the concern of safety is important. A lot of time yes. this is done in the outpatient settings. Uh, uh, you yes. don't have the equipment to deal with a situation of some, something goes wrong. So, uh, yeah. uh, and there are concerns, of course, of, on exposure to those uh, anesthetics, specifically in this young age group. So uh, they, they try to they do their best to come, keep the baby calm with giving him a good feed or a, a pacifier or breastfeed at the time of your dynamics. So again, the setup becomes again more complex, and I, I think it's, it's it's if you can do it well, that's fine. But I think it's very exhausting, and then yeah. yes, you get a you lot are, of you are right. problems. You are right. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you, uh, Ahmed. For the third type of urodynamic pattern, uh, or for the pattern you have mentioned as the third type in the cartoon, uh, in which there is underactive bladder and the underactive uh, sphincter. And in, in that time, uh, CIC is not uh, needed until this child is ready to be continent 
And this child should be followed um, regularly because a change in his urodynamic pattern, especially in the urethra, could happen that uh, uh, leads to pressure and deteriorate, uh, deterioration of the upper uh, tract. My question is why we um, abstain Ahmad? Ahmad, why we abstain from doing CIC in this third category? We can continue doing the CIC in this category. In my, in my philosophy, uh, the family and the child will get accustomed over the years to do the CIC, and especially those children will eventually need to have uh, anti-incontinence surgery, bladder neck reconstruction, augmentation, and mitrofenov and they will be put on CIC and we have to guarantee the commitment and compliance of the family and the child for the CIC. What do you think? Yes, I totally agree with you. So even if it's not needed, it's better that to have the patient and family trained on doing CIC. So if, if you do it uh, for other patients every four hours or four or five times a day, in this group, maybe it's helpful to do it once or twice a day just uh, for so that they would not forget the habit of doing CICs, the child is accustomed to it and the family is well trained and mastering the technique. Maybe you don't need it at the meantime, but when they get older, they may need CIC and reintroduction of CIC at this uh, stage could be difficult because the child becomes more aware, more rebellion, refusing uh, the idea of uh, doing CIC. It looks a scary experience. So again, uh, it's good to keep the family and the patient in the habit of do, doing CIC, even if they don't need it in the meantime. Ahmed, um, aside, uh, uh, aside from those children who are, who are having uh, a weak uh, outlet and they are uh, going to perform uh, anti-incontinence surgery coupled with augmentation to correct the outlet problem and the bladder capacity problem, uh, aside from those children, what are your um, strict criteria uh, for indications for doing augmentation cystoplasty for your children uh, put on CIC and the anticholinergic and follow-up? Uh, do you wait until the upper tract starts to show changes or do you, or do you rely on changes in the uh, urodynamic pattern of the bladder? What are the criteria for doing augmentation cystoplast? Yes, I think this is a difficult question, Dr. Heisem. I think it's very difficult for anyone to answer that question. Again, it's, uh, you would manage every patient on case-by-case base, on case -case basis. So uh, uh, clinical is important and the, uh, in terms of increased witness between catheterization, repeated febrile infection. Some changes on the ultrasound may be not... Uh, 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 upper tract or in terms of hydronephrosis, but maybe you start to see some thickening in the bladder wall. Maybe you start to see some changes. The bladder becomes more trabeculated on VCUG. Urodynamics would certainly complete the picture, but I don't think there is a clear cutoff at that, at, at that point. You should proceed with surgery right away other than uh, upper tract changes. So at what point you would uh, uh, proceed with augmentation. I mean, if the upper tract looks okay, the patient is doing CIC and they're happy with the status of the continent status that they have. If you have reduced bladder compliance, I mean, at what point, if the compliance is less than 20, less than 10, less than five, I don't know, I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. And you would manage that on, on case by case basis. So I don't know what you think. And would you try to do Botox uh, injection first before you embark on augmentation cystoplasty in those children? Yes, it, it differs according to the setup and the situation, the facilities you have. In. We know it's expensive. It's not a durable option. So uh, I think it's a good way to buy you some time if the family is hesitant in proceeding with augmentation. The child is still too young and they don't like to have uh, some sort of incontent diversion. So. Uh, it, it's helpful to buy you some time. It's not uh, a curative or definitive treatment, but it can buy you some time if you have the facility or, and if the family is accepting repeated exposure to anesthesia and surgery to defer the decision of bladder augmentation. Yes. Ahmed, um, I'm very happy with the, uh, with the case scenario you mentioned. 
about the child with neurogenic bladder, who, the girl, who had uh, bladder outlet uh, weakness, and they did for her a uh, sling procedure without doing anything for, uh, for the bladder. Um, uh, I assume that they are doing CIC uh, per urethra or not. Not, I don't know. It was not clear in the, in yes, the scenario. It has, it has to be mentioned to the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, first, the, the CIC is being performed or not, or the child is allowed to void volitionally or not. I don't know. Um, in our school in Alexandria, and what I have learned when I was in France with Alain Gunemi, when you touch the bladder neck in a child with myelomeningocele or neurogenic bladder, you do concomitantly augmentation uh, cystoplasty, and we learned from the experience of Snodgrass when he started to show us a sling with aggressive anticholinergics, and after years, he mentioned that about one third of his patients showed upper tract deterioration and needed further, uh, further treatment. So uh, our strategy is to do a bladder outlet procedure, whatever the procedure is, concomitantly with augmentation cystoplasty and the metrophanol. I would like to know your opinion. So what we do, I, I would rather get urodynamics routinely, of course, before proceeding with any kind of surgery in a patient with uh, spina bifida. And I think this is very helpful in uh, choosing the proper way of treatment. Uh, I would do an outlet either way, even if I'm not doing a bladder augmentation. But if the bladder was, capacity was very reasonable, uh, I would be reluctant. Uh, and the bladder pressure was very safe. I would be reluctant to, to perform uh, concomitant augmentation, but if the bladder is really small and the compliance is poor, I would certainly go for augmentation at the time of bladder neck surgery. Uh, this is for males and females. Uh, again, if we take the same scenario you, you, you mentioned, if the child is a male, what you are going to do for the outlet resistance, and the child is a female, you did a sling procedure. And a sling, it allows for the CIC per urethra. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, um, for males, for males, what you are going to do and how you guarantee for the CIC period is. Okay, so we have to agree that uh, unlike the extra population, only a small percentage of patients with neurogenic bladder would require an outlet procedure. The majority would have the synergic sphincters with high leak point pressure and those do not uh, require an outlet surgery. Unlike the extra population, a vast majority of them uh, would require an outlet procedure to achieve dryness or the presumed volitional voiding. Uh, and we have, should have different mentalities when approaching a patient with a bladder x-ray compared to a patient with neurogenic blood. Uh, when we do a, an outlet procedure in a patient with bladder x-ray, our main objective is to try to achieve volitional voiding or to have them void periurethra compared to the spina bifida population, is our goal is to make them dry. And we know that they would uh, uh, be maintained on CIC in, uh, anyways. So uh, uh, when we're doing a bladder outlet surgery for a patient with CIC, I think we do try to make the patient as dry as possible. So we don't, we make a bit narrower channel uh, compared to those with bladder extrophy. And of course, the bladder next links works better in females. It, I would not advise it in males unless you combine it with other outlet procedure. Uh, the options we have is bladder neck injection. It does not work, at least in our experience. Uh, bladder next links, uh, again, we don't do it as an isolated procedure. Usually we augment other procedures with bladder next links. So we may do like the routine bladder neck reconstruction irrespective of the technique you use combined with bladder uh, neck slings. In males, you can do whatever technique you like, but you keep in your, your mind that um, it, it's a way of achieving dryness and not uh, volitional voiding. And those patients would require CIC anyway. So I would uh, do a concomitant outlet procedures. I don't think it matters what technique you use. Uh, you can use whatever technique you like as long as you achieve good results. In Mansoura, we do the Mitchell technique for both extrophy and uh, uh, neurogenic bladder patients, and it works well. Uh, 
uh, when I was in fellowship, Dr. Corey used to do with a young bees. Uh, he had good results as well. So I, I don't think the techniques matters most, but uh, do whatever you're comfortable with or whatever gives you good results. But for 10 years in bladder patients, uh, again, our goal is to achieve dryness, not volation and void. Ahmed, I, I don't like to bother you anymore, <laughs> but discussion with you is uh, interesting. Uh, I'm very happy with allergy. Uh, uh, me and uh, Dr. Youssef uh, recently, uh, Dr. Walid, Dr. Ahmed Fahmi, they, they will remember a child multi-operated with myelomeningocele who had severe hypotension when we were doing for him bladder outlet, uh, surgery, augmentation, and mitrofen. And the anesthetist was not aware of, uh, uh, of the problem of the latex uh, allergy. And thanks God, we told the anesthetist uh, immediately that this patient is suffering from latex uh, allergy. And the hypotension was uh, still present through the procedure in fluctuations. They correct it, they give uh, adrenaline, they give um, uh, cortisone, they give uh, fluids, they give everything, it, it, it comes good, and after some time, it, hypertension recurs again, and thanks God, the patient was saved at the end of uh, the procedure. So latex allergy is present. It is my first time to see it actually in practice. And I learned it um, a lot from this case. And uh, a latex-free environment is very important in a good center dealing with uh, uh, myelomeningocele. Um, yes, that's why I mentioned this scenario. It's rare. I have never seen it myself. Uh, sometimes we don't have the luxury of having a latex-free environment. Um, I think like in our country and most of other like developing countries, we have limited resources. We don't have this variety of equipments, but in, in, in fellowship, for example, in the States, uh, any patient who is uh, uh, exposed to repeated surgery, even in, uh, other than the spina bifida patient, is considered uh, to have latex allergy until proved otherwise, and they would label him with labels that uh, to take uh, lit, to keep him in latex-free environment. They have gloves that are latex-free and catheters that are latex-free and so on. Unfortunately, we don't have this uh, luxury, I think, in most of our centers, but maybe at some point uh, we can yeah. have the facility, but at least we should be aware of that complication that could yeah. happen and yes. it could be fatal. Thanks, Ahmed. I will leave you with Shuman. I unmuted uh, Shuman, but before I leave with you, Shuman, because I have some urgency to, to ask about the colon, um, uh, uh, are you take caring of the colon yourself, or you are sending the patient to gastroenterologist to take care of the colon? Um, you mean for the bowel uh, management? Yeah, yeah, for the bowel uh, management in children's mild dysplasia. Actually, we try to send them um, to a pediatric GIT specialist. We, we can manage and troubleshoot for those who have maces, we increase the volumes, but I would rather prefer that they establish the uh, a care with the uh, pediatric uh, gastroenterologist. They thanks, have Ahmed. They have other Dr. options that we don't know. Yeah, thanks, Ahmed. Dr. Shuman, with you. Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed Shuman. Yeah, Basha, thanks for the, alhamdulillah, thanks for the very comprehensive and informative uh, lecture. Uh, and I have just a couple of questions, uh, and I guess the, the problem pattern in this uh, patients with the spinal bifida patients is uh, this, the output. Yeah, if whatever whatever the output uh, resistance is uh, reflects the upper tract deterioration. Yes. So uh, I would like to know what's the incidence of this of DSD, our instinctive dysenergy in these patients. Um, this is my first question, because I think these are the patients who will benefit from the proactive uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, I want to understand: uh, uh, How can it be a patient with an underactive sphincter? Uh, uh, having an upper tract deterioration. Yani how a patient who's totally wet uh, and sphincter is completely yani, uh, irreactive and he will have an upper tract deterioration. And how can this child, like the, the question you asked, uh, this child with a, a high detrusal leak point pressure that is 50 with a very weak abdominal leak point pressure that is uh, 70 or 60. Um, I, I still don't get this combination together. 
Okay, uh, let's focus on the first question. Let's agree that diagnosis of the, the truth of the dysenergia based on uh, urinary sometimes it's very difficult or you have to use needle electrodes. Uh, you get, if you use the patch electrodes, you get with movements and so you get what seems that looks like sphincter activity. Is it true sphincter activity or not? I don't know. But at least we know that two thirds of the patients uh, uh, this is a study, I think, from Board, from Boston, and they reported that almost two thirds of the patients have the truth or sphincter dysenergia. And um, if we look at the other study here, so again, so this study that I mentioned, the least consistent was on the diagnosis of the truth or sphincter dysenergia. Again, I think it's very difficult to uh, assess even with urodynamics. Uh, the second question, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if I answered the, the first question. Yes, yeah. yes, you answered, yes, yes, you answered. Okay. But, I, but I the think second that, question, uh, I, but do you on think it's... deterioration on uh, those with weak outlet? Yes, I'm with you. Yes, uh, so patients with weak outlet are unlikely to uh, have upper tract deterioration if they continue to maintain the same uh, urodynamic pattern, but we know that bladder dynamics may change. The bladder itself uh, or the trusor may become overactive. The, even a proportion of those with synergic sphincter may become dyssynergic over time. And of course, if you do surgery to increase the outlet resistance, the bladder dynamics could also change. Yes, so, so, th so this is the main issue and this is the main problem. And this is the problem with doing uh, surgery for the outlet without doing uh, concomitant augmentation. But what I'm saying is I don't think that a child with an underactive sphincter, even if, even if he's, in, if he's, if he's uh, having uh, an overactive bladder at this time, it would ever affect his upper tract. That, that's what I think about and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you mean underactive sphincter even with overactive bladder? Yes. I don't know. Theoretically, it could happen, but I don't know in real in, in, in real practice what what are the chances. I don't know. But uh, theoretically, yes, I, I'm with you. But uh, I mean, over time, the bladder compliance is very low. Yes, leak is protective, but even if they are storing uh, small amounts, because sometimes the outlet is is not nailed. It, you have some outlet resistance, but maybe it's weak. I'm totally with you that uh, some leak is, is protective for the upper tract, but if this uh, weak sphincter changes over time to become dysenergic at this point, we would have upper tract changes. So to summarize, uh, I would like to say that uh, really this, uh, this uh, uh, it's a spectrum of a disease. It's from white to, gray to, to black. Yes, and, in between, and in between, there are different colors for the yes, sphincter yes, and for yes. the bladder. That's true. Yes. There's so, no what, when, when, so whenever this the sphincteric tone gets higher than the, the the bladder activity, so this is endangering the upper tract. Yes, you are in trouble. Yes, that's true. Yes, Thank yes. So uh, this leads us to the third question about uh, this uh, uh, scenario of the child that he, she had uh, a retrosalic point pressure of fifty, and an abdominal point pressure I think of sixty. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 that, I'm, I'm not getting how she, can you get a retrosalic point pressure that's very high with uh, a very weak sphincter, unless you're doing the urodynamics uh, uh, on different uh, occasions. Yani first you're pulling on the outlet and checking how's the bladder, and second you're leaving the outlet and le letting her leak uh, and checking her leak uh, abdominal point pressure. Do you understand me? Uh, I'm not sure I, I quite get your point. But. Uh, and I'm sure him is the entire test with the truth leak point pressure. You also have seen Carlos when the sphincter but that I could outlet that I could have been a call so big out Hey, this is the main issue of the of how to how to to get really these children and in the tariff in the bladder but I told Tabana and the government outlet but I'm bored with a man. She's she's leaking at very low pressure. These children, mm -hmm. they are leaking at very low pressure and very low capacity. No, no, but the, this happened after <laughs> surgery. The rise in the truth of leak point pressure happened after surgery, after you had some outlet. No, uh, no, 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 this was the question. Uh, 
بس فاهم بس دكتور احمد ده مش هتخش دكتور غريب بس ضمن الكويست بتاع 70 ده مش ده مش ذيس از نوت ا بور اوت ده مش اوت ضعيف ده اوت اكتب تمام الابدومين ليك بوينت بريشر ابدومين ليك بوينت بريشر 60 اتس ا فيري ويك اوتلت اتس ا فيري ويك اوتلت اتس فروم ليس ذان 80 اتس ا فيري ويك اوتلت فروم 80 تو 100 اتس لا اي اولموست نورمال اند اباف 100 اتس 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 ان اوفر كوم اوكي ليتس ليتس اجري ذات وي فور بيشنتس وذ نيوروجينيك بلادر وات كونسيرز موست از ذا بروس ليك بوينت بريشر وي ويل بوت ماتش ليس ويت اون ذا Uh, yes, but but you, but you can't get the high with the true zelic point pressure with a very weak outlet. That's what that's what I'm I'm, I'm asking, and this is a problem when we're doing aerodynamics. If you're doing aerodynamics without a balloon capture, without a, an inflated balloon, you can't get this true zelic point pressure because the child is leaking all the time. Yes, I agree. Do you yes, understand? You tried, yes, you tried to troubleshoot like putting a balloon catheter in the urethra, but. Well, as, as if I remember the scenario, the increase in the outlet uh, resistance or the rise in the leak point pressure was after the outlet surgery. The can answer the the answer you said the oxy if you did how will it improve the true leak point pressure or will it improve the abdominal leak point pressure? It will not improve anything. It will not improve anything. And I, it does not act on the uh, sphincter. It, it it you can have more storage before leak starts. You can have. Uh, lower bladder pressure until leak starts, but it does not affect the, the, the leak point pressures. And I agree that it does not affect the abdominal leak point pressure, but why yes, is it not affect it? The... You can have the same uh, leak point pressure, but instead of storing, uh, let's say, uh, 100 mLs, you can store 150 or 200 mLs uh, with the same leak point pressure or at lower detrusor pressure. But when you reach a Let's say, for example, a 50 centimeter water, then the bladder would start leaking. So you can store more at a lower pressure, but you still have leak at the same leak point pressure, irrespective of the oxybutynin treatment. But this is what we. But this is you're 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 uh, 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 getting the compliance better, and so when you're yes. getting the compliance better, so you're postponing the augmentation if you need to. Y yes, you store more at lower pressure, but. Uh, and you protect the upper tract that way, but uh, it does not affect the leak point pressure. So uh, with uh, oxybutynin, if the patient was, was leaking at 100 mL uh, with a pressure of 40, they still leak mm -hmm. at a pressure of 40, but maybe with a bladder storing 150 or 200 mL or so, for example. Yes, 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 I agree with you. Uh, okay, you one last score more and uh, without leaking, and that way the bladder is safer for the upper tract. Yes, so, so if the you increase it reaches the same point, yes, but yes. at a larger bladder volume, you'd still have leak. Yes, I understand. So, but, but, this, but this, I think, this is, uh, 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 means that our treatment is effective because um, the yes, more you... Still, uh, yes, it still works. Yes, so more, yes. more urine uh, and lower pressure, and this is a successful treatment. Yes. Ahmed, sorry. Ahmed, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Ghanimi, let me take you with us. Thank uh, one last question, but do you ask for urodynamics for a child who's going to do a surgery prior to surgery? Uh, yes, you mean urologic surgery, not neurosurgery. No, 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 neurosurgery. Neurosurgery. Yes, y yes. again, the, you mean for uh, cord detethering or other? For whatever, yes, for whatever problem, if it's a closed spina bifida, if it's a problem with the yes, tethered cord, if it's a problem with myelomeningeal seal, but, but it was diagnosed later and we're going to operate later in life, not in the first two years, two, yes, two days yes. of life. Mm -hmm. Would you ask for urodynamics maybe at three months before surgery? Yes, I would ask for urodynamics again if it, uh, if it would change the decision or not. The decision of these cases is, is very complex. Because surgery itself may in, 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 inside damage or uh, makes the situation even worse. So it's good to understand what's your baseline. So a lot of those kids with tethered cord, they may have uh, normal motor function and some of with minimal like voiding problems or so. And again, surgery, it can improve the situation, but it also can make the situation worse. worse. So proceeding with surgery itself is not an easy decision. So, of course, I would like to get baseline before proceeding with surgery. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, very much. For the... Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, Dr. Ghanim? Dr. Ghanim? Dr. Ghanim? I have three questions. 
واحد فيهم تكنيكال شويه اي دونت وانت ميك ات مور ديفيكال فور ذا اورينس بس هسال دكتور احمد عبد الحليم اكزاكتلي في السيم بوينت اللي دكتور كمان كان بيسال فيها اللي هو الامباكت اوف انتي كولينرجيك اون ذا كوزر ليك بوينت بريشر اند ابدومن ليك بوينت بريشر هو السؤال اللي فيه ديبيت امونج اول يو ذان اول دكتور دوينج يو ذان امس يعني از وين دو يو ميجر ذا ديك ذا كوزر ليك بوينت بريشر دو يو ميجر ات اون ذا كوزر كيرف طب وات اف ذا كوزر كيرف هاز سوبر امبوز ذا كوزر انستابيليتي يس ساعتها هتقيس ال diffuser deep point pressure على ال superimposed instability ولا على الكيرف نفسه؟ if you measure it على ال superimposed diffuser instability لا يبقى لما هتدي اوكسي بيتونين هينزل ال diffuser deep point pressure لان ال instability هتختفي. لو if you measure it على الكيرف العادي مش هيأثر اه هيبقى ثابت. عشان كده you have to check لو انت قايس ال diffuser deep point pressure دي على instability ولا على كيرف smooth. لو انت قايسها على كيرف سموث يبقى لما هتدي اوكسي بيتنين مش هتتاثر لو انت قايسها على انستابيليتي يبقى ديفينتلي لما هتدي اوكسي بيتنين هتتاثر. ايوه يا اي اجري وذ يو اجين سو ذا انتربريتيشن اوف يور دايناميك ريزلت از اجين از انكونسيستنت سو باك تو ذا بوينت تشينجينج ذا مانجمنت از بيزد اون كلينيكال راديولوجيكال اند ذا يور دايناميكس از ويل بات Again, uh, interpretation of uh, uh, neurodynamics can be very debatable, and uh, I don't think I'm, I'm the yeah. best one to answer most of the questions on neurodynamics. I'm not talking about interpretation. I'm talking about the question that is not agreed on. Ma'am, we have a lot of debates. Exactly. If we get to the decision that we measure the total leak point pressure on the curve or on the superimposed instability, هنقدر نحدد بس دي مختلفة من واحد بيعمل يوزر انامكس تو ذا اذر بس مش اكتر ده اللي انا بقوله يعني تمام شكرا يا دكتور محمد عايز توصل ايه؟ دكتور محمد كان بيسال ودي حاجة بيورلي يعني ثيوراتيكال خالص وحاجة ليها علاقة بالكوميونتي اللي احنا عايشين فيه. If we choose for the bladder management the bottom for example we all know that the child with the spina bifida is a long term treatment. If you choose to do him botox then you will be condemned ان انت تعمل له botox every six or nine months for a long time. So? I agree with you. Society, they are uh, developing countries, they must. Do you think that you will be able to sustain this? No, no, I, I, I agree with you. Again, it differs according to the setting, according to the family and the insurance system. And if you have uh, uh, payers for the care in, in Egypt here, it's very difficult, even for the public hospitals like our academic centers. You cannot uh, secure Botox uh, regularly and uh, repeatedly. It's very difficult and uh, cost-wise, I think it does not work. Uh, that, but for other for other countries, line of treatment that country developing they must صعب أوي نحنا نأخذه كخط علاجي مستمر يعني. I don't think. Uh, I, tot I totally agree with you. If the patients are, are uh, still not interested in achieving continence, we can do incontinent diversion with vesicostomy or so. If you decided to move on with surgery, if they are older, then you will have to augment the bladder and uh, create an outlet or so on. The question is about the fact that we have to talk about among all of us is the, the, the proper line of management for type 4. That's the, I, mean, I think in the type 1 with, uh, with the static sphincter, I, we will manage it with the CIC. That's what I understood. And, uh, The type 4 bell, the type where we have uh, a hyperactive bladder with a weak sphincter. That, I think this is the most debatable. And in the, if you manage the, the, the hyperactive bladder with an augmentation or with Botox, you leave a weak sphincter behind. So, El, would you jump, I think, يعني, to an outlet procedure in the first Well, would you go for lowering the bladder pressure in the first and reassessing the outlet? أحسن أو هيتحسن مع lowering the pressure ولا لا؟ I think إن دكتور هيثم the school in Alexandria goes for both procedure at the same time صح ولا أنا غلطان في تويس؟ Again if the outlet is weak خليني أجاوب الأول بعدين دكتور دكتور هيثم اتفضل if the outlet is weak sometimes it's very difficult to judge the bladder and because it's leaking all the time you cannot store uh, yes so um, uh, I, I think the It's a it's an agreement with the family. Would would you do one surgery and wait how it works, or do all all in one? I think 
it, it differs from one family to the other and from انا سالي هنا يو دايناميكلي او كلينيكلي ما فيش طريقه تقدر تعتمد عليها اللي تقول اوكي okay, this guy or this kid i'm going to do for him only augmentation this kid احمد احمد بعد اذنك we we will not we will not in our practice jump to any kind of surgery first to dr gunim Mm-hmm. We will start um, uh, in all those children with medical treatment, as Ahmed said, even those category of patients yeah. with CIC. I'm asking, if you reach a point where you Mau, decide Mau, that this yeah, kid needs Mau, Dr. Yeah, yes, Dr. Ghanemi, uh, I think when you start with CIC and the anticholinergics and follow up of those children, mm-hmm. you will have a clear answer for your question with time. and with repeating the eurodynamic study with your repeating the not not necessarily for the sound and doing it for the child no. not necessarily ليه لان انت most of the procedure you're doing انت if you start an uh, proactive management uh, conservative انت هتدي anticholinergic and you will go on CIC the anticholinergic yes. if they don't succeed in lowering the bladder pressure وده هيبقى القرار اللي يخليك to move on to augmentation مش هيبقى لهم اي impact على outcome يعني عشان الانتي كولينرجي تبقى ليها امباكت على الاوتلت they have to lower the bladder pressure لو ما وصلتش احمد غنيمي اتس اوكي بس يو ويل هاف ان انسر فور يور كويشن بمعنى ايه؟ دلوقتي انت بتسال سؤال هل اعمل حاجه للبلادر واسيب الاوتلت كويس وابقى اشوف الاوتلت دي هتتحسن ولا لا وبعد كده ابقى اعمل لها سيرجري ولا لا؟ انا بالسي اي سي والانتي كولينرجي هجاوب على السؤال بتاعك بمعنى لو الانتي كولينرجيكس دي ظبطت البلادر ووطت البلادر بريشر وخليته نون هوستايل اند ذا تشايلد از ستيل ويت ان بيتوين ذا كاسترايزيشن سو يس سو هي از اوتلت نيد تو بي ادريست لا انا انا مش okay. بتكلم على ده خالص انا بتكلم على الكاتيجوري اللي خد انتي كولينرجيك اند ات نيفر سكسيدد ان لورينج هيز بلادر بريشر سو هي ستيل ليك Uh, it's okay. In, in in that patient, I'm going to address both bladder and the outlet resistance. Why? So, what is the question? Why to address the outlet? Maybe if you lower the bladder pressure with surgery, like the augmentation, once the pressure in the bladder is lower, the outlet can handle it and he doesn't leak. And I want to. I I have already an evidence before surgery that the bladder outlet is weak. And I don't dare, I don't dare actually to do the augmentation without addressing the bladder outlet. لا أنت ال outlet بتاعك ده بحكم عليه في وجود high pressure. أنت ما حكمتش عليه لما توصي ال bladder pressure. فهي النقطة هنا إن هو هي ما. لا. And the true leak point pressure is not is is a reflection of the outlet resistance and not a reflection of the bladder wall function. Am I am I right or wrong? لا هو السؤال مش على لا لا الديتوزر ليك بوينت بريشر از ا ريفلكشن اوف ذا اوتلت ات بلادر بريشر بس احنا اوريدي التشايلد ده وي ونت اون بالديسيجن فور اوجمنتيشن وين وي فاوند اوت ان الانتي كولينرجيك فيلد تو ريديوس البلادر بريشر فبالتالي احنا هنا كاننا ما عملناش حاجه خالص انت هنا كانك ما حطيتوش على علاج فانت حكمك على الاوتلت لن يتغير يعني لو الانتي كولينرجيك فشلت ما فيش حاجه حصلت عشان تغير حكمك على الاوتلت طب غنيمي بص هو ايهاب رافق معانا خلاص هو انا كنت عايز هيثم السلام عليكم كنت عايز اكمل مع الدكتور مع الدكتور غنيمي اذا كان اوريدي اوريدي في ليكج على ان البرادر ليك بوينت بريشر قليل وده بيحصل ليكج برضه فهو ليه انت بتعتبر ان الاوجمنتيشن هتحسن يبقى المشكله في الاوتلت مش في البرادر نفسها ده قصدي من اليوروداينامك يعني ذيس از ام جونا اكسبلين حاجه بسيطه قوي ليتس ليتس جيف ات نمبرز عشان اوضحها يعني ايه لازم جيفت نمبرز عشان اوضحها if the bladder inside the if the pressure inside the bladder is 40 cm water and the outlet is leaking is leaking طيب what if we lower the pressure ده من 40 ل 20 would you expect the outlet behavior to be the same ولا to improve طب لو عكسنا السؤال يا محمد لو قلنا ان البريشر من الاول مثلا 30 اوكي okay. هو عنده ليكج برضه حلو قوي خلينا نتكلم اكشولي سبيكينج يعني الاوتلت الاوتلت فانكشن هازن بين ستادي ذات ماتش ان تشيلدرن بس ليتس هناخد ريفلكشن من الادلت بروسيجرز 
احنا عارفين ان الاوتلت ده الكاتيجوري بتاعت الاوتلت مع الابدومينال ليك بوينت بريشر عشان كده انا كنت معترض على الستيتمنت بتاع الدكتور كومان ان الابدومينال ليك بوينت بريشر لما تبقى 70 ذس از ا فيري بور اوتلت لا ده مش صحيح لان احنا حن لو عملنا اكستراكوليشن للكلام ده للستات فور اكزامبل اللي اتدرس فيهم الاوتلت كتير قوي الستريس انكونتنس وده بس ستادي للابدومينال ليك بوينت بريشر لو ان من 60 ل 90 ده ذس از ايه ا مايل ستريس امتى نكونسيدر ده سفير ستريس or a very poor outlet if we drop below 60. يعني لو نزلنا اقل من من 60 سنتيمتر ووتر. ف ابوف 60 سنتيمتر ووتر از ان اكسبتبل اوتلت، اتس نوت سوتش ا بور اوتلت. او اتليست غنيمي غنيمي بليز انكوربريت دكتور احمد عبد الحليم with you in the discussion. احمد انت معانا؟ انا معاك انا سامع الدسكشن يعني. اتفضل. I agreed with with دكتور غنيمي to some point. Uh, so by doing uh, or giving anticholinergic or augmenting the bladder, you can still Increase the storage yes, right. capacity. Yes, exactly. leakage was okay at the same point when the, 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 the leak point pressure is reached. You do not affect the outlet, but you still increase the storage capacity so that they can store more before leakage happens. Exactly. How is how is not? And then the mungkin and then the goes in the leakage we have at a certain storage volume. فانت if you increase the storage volume, you get a drier interval. Well, if I can simply by augmentation and increasing the frequency of CIC, you can get a dry child without touching the outlet. Why am I saying this? Because the outlet procedure for the child is very risky. The success of it is very good, but the failure is very bad. Very bad. And plus, the failure of the outlet procedure will make you, because you are afraid of the outlet procedure, very often it will cover the outlet procedure with the phenol channel for fear. ان الاوتلت اوردت يبقى نون كاستريزبل يعني لو كان الاوتلت بروسيجر دايما مضمون ما كناش لجانا ان احنا نعمل ا سكندري شانل فور كاستريزيشن عشان كده اي دونت لايك جامبينج تو ان اوتلت بروسيجر من غير ما لور البلادر بريشر عشان اوفويد الايه المشاكل اللي ممكن تحصل يس دكتور غنيم اي اجري ويز يو سو وي وودنت جامب فور ذا اوتلت بروسيجر انتل فور ذيس كاتيجوري وذ فيري لو ليك بوينت بريشر Funneled bladder neck on uh, VCUGs and very smooth bladder exactly. and normal upper tract. I don't know about Rahmat exactly. And there are criteria. It's my think... point. The 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 Yes, I can That's accept some opinion. leak. Yes, some leak could right. happen, but again, this is protective to the upper tract. And if it proves to be bothersome later on, you can go back in and do the blood or neck or outlet surgery if uh, augmentation uh, only did not work. Hi, Sam. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Ahmed, many thanks, Tawa Ahmed. The very, very, يعني illustrative lecture, very heavy information. But the reality is. انا كنت عايز اسال الاكسبيرينس بتاعتك هل انت طبعا احنا عارفين الابروفد ميديكيشن هو الاوكسبيتين لكن في اذر ترايلز كتير من التروسبيم والسلفينسين والميلبرجرون والحاجات دي كلها لكن هل انت يعني عندك اكسبيرينس لو ما استخدمت الادويه دي ات ميك ديفرنس يعني امبروف ذا يورو دايناميكس بارامترز او انت اجلت الديسيجن بتاعك كنت هعمل اوجمنتيشن ما عملتش هل ات ميك ديفرنس الادويه دي I don't have, uh, thank you, Dr. Ab, for the question. I don't have solid data on uh, uh, that any um, anticholinergic medication is superior to the other in terms of efficacy, at least. Um, I think the only advantage with the other medication that uh, you can improve compliance by giving the medication once a day. So uh, oxybutynin, mm -hmm. at least the liquid form, if you don't have the XL or sustained release forms, you have to give it three times a day. Other medications that uh, tortoradine, for example, you give it twice a day, and if you have the uh, sustained release form, you give it once a day. Is sufenacine or other more selective medications you can give it once a day, and uh, so that way you can improve the compliance, and at the same time, you can have uh, safer or uh, less less side effects compared to the oxybutynin. But uh, 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 what I know is the oxybutynin is the only FDA approved medication yeah. for use in children. Yeah. Ahmed, listen, 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 uh, published, uh, published an article about neurogenic bladder in children in the Journal of Pediatric Urology is still uh, this year. 
about the use of the uh, sorifenacin or the sofinacin and the children at younger age than five years. تمام كلها ترايل طبعا هيثم يعني كلنا هتلاقي كل واحد فينا بيستخدمه في سن كده من دماغه اعتقد يعني. So how, how do you give it, Dr. Hab? Do you crush the tablets or it's not present in liquid form? So how do you give it? Some medication, طبعا may be dispersed in, uh, يعني في مية في عصير ممكن ده بيحصل وبياخد الدوز دي. طبعا بقول لك كلها ترايلز كده مش ابروف طبعا. لكن uh, كلنا اكيد بنستخدم حاجات كده يعني personal experience, I think. Yes, I, I don't have, yes. Uh, knowledge from the pharmaceutical standpoint but in some countries for example the gel form or that uh, transdermal form is available mm. yes the gel I have a question on CIC and anticholinergic and the serum creatinine mm. you think that they it... have upper tract changes in terms yes. of uh, Uh, hydronephrosis and so yes. yes the question is what to do what to do yes uh, i i i would try to increase the frequency of catheterization even with overnight catheter if that does not work i would do incontinent diversion with, with the customers yes طبعا سؤال يرو ديناميك ده اخر سؤال ليا هيثم معلش انا كان عامل لي كونفيوجن ان لا لا ابدا يا عيال براحتك خالص حبيبي نعمل يرو ديناميك عن ثلاث شهور انا اعتقد ان احمد جاوب ان هو حتى يعني المنصوره اللي هو يعني ما بتعملوهاش يا احمد عن ثلاث شهور اي ثينك اتس نوت فيزبل تو دو ات اند ايفن عم سافرت بصراحه يعني مور ذان ون ذا ادفنتشرز ذات ذي كم فروم ديفرنت باك جراوندز اند ذا فيزيشنز هاف ديفرنت تريننج We have uh, Dr. Corey with his experience. We've never done uh, urodynamics, I think, under the age of two years, in, and, and except in very select situations. Also, it uh, doesn't change the plan of treatment, I think. Yes, what is yes. Yes. And, and we have other physicians that trained in sick kids and others that trained in Vanderbilt and uh, uh, San Francisco, and they have the same impression. So uh, it's very difficult to do in very young age. It does not change the management, and it, They do not do it routinely in very young age. Thank you. Ahmed Al Ayanin, and then up to neurogenic bladder myelomeningocele. Usually, ma bi gulnash abl. Yani, daiman bi gulna mutakhirin. Baad sana, wa baad sanatin, wa baad talal. Ella, lo kan fi kiriat ziyada hisam. Lo kiriatin ziyada shwaya da hagi lak ba abad. Ah, ehna mhtajin zaud al awareness btaa al neurosurgeons. No, no, no. He sent us the patient. Yes, I think this is our mistake, and we have to work to improve this. We have to make the pediatricians, the neurologist, and the neurosurgeon aware of this problem. And we were actually trying to organize something about this or an awareness day for the neurosurgeons and pediatricians so that they send or uh, the patients right away after the spine closure or even in the NICU, they should have or get a urology consultation and establish care with a urologist. I think this is our mistake and we should work hard to fix that problem. Because yes, we get patients, we don't get patients, some patients until they get to the age of three or four years. Yeah. And they have hydronephrosis, recurrent infection, and the family is concerned mainly about achieving continence. And when they do imaging, they have bad kidneys and bad blood and this is yeah. of yeah. course a bad situation. Yeah. You have, uh, did, did you finish the questions? Thanks, say something. Thanks. 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 أنا أقول سؤال بس كده سريع. اه اتفضل دكتور غنيم اتفضل. أنا بس كنت عايز أبعت ألارم زي بتاع اللاتكس كده للنيورولوجيست إن جنرال على موضوع اليوز أوف الكلورال هايدريت في اليوروداينامكس. هو طبعًا إحنا أيف سين ألوت أوف بيبل يوزينج كلورال هايدريت سبيشلي في الأطفال عشان يهدوهم عشان يعرف ياخد نتيجة يوروداينامكس ستادي كويسة. وذا وذا كليم اللي أنا طول عمري كنت بسمعه إن الكلورال هايدريت إز ريليتيف الاطفال هو سبوزبلي ات از يعني فارماسيوتيكلي بيقولوا ان هو ريلاتيفلي سيف ولكن اي هاف تو تيل ان انا هاف سين ات ليست وانس اور تويس سيفير انا فلاكسس من الكورونا هايدريت فا ام جاست اتيلينج ايفري بودي يعني يا جماعه تيك كير اتس نوت سوتش سيف ميديكيشن ات ريكوير هو موجود يا محمد دلوقتي الكلور هايدريت موجود يعني. موجود وافيلبل انا انا عمري ما حسيت ان هو بيعمل انرجيزا كويسه هو كله بيعمل فلاشنج وحمار Sedation is given properly after the procedure by about, for example, half an hour, thirty minutes. They they make the child sleepy and drowsy, and they make him happy. 
ثرو اوت البروسيجر وطبعا ما بتقدرش تاخد اي حكم على البويدنج فيز لانك ما بتقدرش تخليه بويد لكن بيديك امبريشن بيخليك قلم قوي في الـ في الفيلنج فيز فبيخليك تحكم على الفيلنج فيز احسن ولكن المشكله الوحيده اللي انا يعني قابلتني مره او اثنين از انا فلاكس وتش برضه بيني وبينكم معظم اليوز انالك بروسيجرز ار دون ان ان اوت بيشنت سيتنج فوين يو هاف انافلاكسس ان ليس ان انت يعني فيليجنت قوي وملاحظ اتس كوايت ريسكي ان يو كان جيت كوايت كير فا جاست تيك كير بالظبط يعني يس اكشولي وي هاف نيفر يوزد ات بيكوز ميبي وي هاف ديفرنت سيتنج از ويل وي دونت براكتس ان ا تشيلدرنز هوسبيتال وي هاف بيور يورولوجي هوسبيتال سو اف سمثينج جوز رونج اي ثينك وير وير I mean, it's, it could be a big problem. So we have never used it. Um, maybe if you work in a children's hospital and have uh, ICU and so it, you can deal with the situation. But again, um, we don't like to be in that situation. I, I don't think anybody would like to be in that situation. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Unfortunately, sometimes you resort to it. Especially for older children. who have gone through a lot of procedures. And some of them have phobia. من doing the urodynamic so sometimes yes. there are options either doing either giving him curar hydrate or taking him to the OP suit and uh, putting him under anesthesia and doing the urodynamic we give we give intra intranasal we give intranasal dormican but with the with the presence of uh, anesthetist uh, yeah we need yeah. yeah. yeah if you do that you should have the proper setup with the equipment to do resuscitation and yeah. the physiologist yeah. the pediatrician in place yeah uh, dr ahmed uh, thank you very much for you. the discussion even uh, before thank you for the presentation the discussion was was excellent more elaborate i think many points are now clear for all of us and for our uh, junior uh, staff who are attending this lecture. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghanemi, Dr. Shuman, Dr. Ehab Rafat, uh, for the, the excellent questions and the excellent discussion as usual. Thank you very much uh, uh, for you all for attending with us. Um, inshallah, next week um, uh, we are arranging um, a lecture uh, with Dr. Hani Abdul Rauf, uh, arranging with uh, our colleague, um, in Kentucky, um, uh, uh, Amanda, I think, the specialist in oncology, she will speak about the management of genitourinary rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, we will announce for uh, uh, the date and timing uh, of the lecture, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank See you, you very soon. Thank you all for your attendance and patience. And I apologize thank again you. for any inconvenience. No, at all. It was fantastic, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.